I'm Elise and earlier this year, well I started November 1st last year running 5,000 miles around the British coast. It took 10 months, 301 days and I finished on August bank holiday this year. Going okay so far. I finally got to the seaside. I've been running for 12 days now. I started crying. I tried to. My shin's niggling a bit. Other than the lost dad situation. Merry Christmas Eve Eve. The coldest I've ever been. With Lorraine today. Walking away from Land's End overslap. And a primo, bloody windy. Hot on my heels, the whole flock. This flooded road. Oh, oh, fuck. It's really exciting. I had a friend today. Finally, run 33 miles. Come fishing. Narnia. Cows in the road. Overheating. Had a fall on some gravel. So foggy. National bring your mum for a run day. Done 36 miles swamp. Back into England. Which hadn't been so useless. Do you know what my pet hate is? Navigating Dartford. Desperate to get in the sea. It seemed like it'd be a good idea um, to just go and run 5,000 miles. <laughs> I was sitting at work one day and I worked for a company who delivered things and I was looking at the map to see if um, we could deliver something and I thought, oh, I wonder if anyone's been around the British coast before. No one at that point had really ran it and I'm still the only woman to have done it self-supported, I think. I'm having such a good day. I'm having a real I like running day. <laughs> told a few people and for some reason nobody told me it was an absolutely stupid idea so then eight months later I was on the start line wondering what on earth I'd signed up for. I finished work two weeks before I actually set off and then the week before I went to a festival, I went to Yesville um, and suddenly I was like oh my gosh everyone knows what I'm doing, people keep asking about it and I haven't done any planning so I haven't got a clue what to actually tell them. First day was fine because lots of people came to run it just felt like I was going for a run around London. I ran to Dartford which is the least inspiring place you could ever start an adventure. <laughs> it was that week before when I was like, oh gosh what have I done I haven't even packed my backpack. It was March the 7th <laughs> and I had actually been home for a few days because my grandma had written a book and I wanted to go to her book launch and I had to get the train back and I just went to pieces and I didn't want to go and I spent the whole train journey crying and people kept asking what was wrong obviously because someone died or something and I just kept saying oh I've got to go for a run <laughs> which didn't really inspire much sympathy. I think it was because at that point I'd been going for about four or five months and we were nowhere near the end and I was thinking if I'd just only chosen to run, run a thousand miles I'd be finished by now. Everyone in the world would still think that was a really long run. I would think that was a really long run. Why am I doing another 4,000 miles? But um, yeah and it just wouldn't stop raining, it was so windy but it got better after that. <laughs> March the 7th was a dark day. So I ran by myself most of the time. I did have people join me for legs which was always nice and my dad visited a lot of times. Um, and I, I, when I set off I thought I'd be camping all of the time so I set off my tent in my bag and actually people were so nice to me that I probably camped less than a third of the time in the end. Um, I stayed with so many people and yeah people were just lovely so I was lucky and had a lot more hot showers than I'd expected to. The mileage each day increased quite a lot as I went along which was always the plan. I hadn't done tons of training and I'd always planned to sort of train on the job. So I think if you work 5,000 miles between the days I was running it's about 17 miles on average but I was doing more sort of 10 to 15 at the beginning and then moving up to about 20 to 30 by the time I got to the end. And as well, that worked with the days got longer. It was, it was dark at four o'clock at the beginning, which was hard. And then I got fitter. The terrain got flatter as well as I went round because the first bit was the Southwest Coast Path, which was super hilly. So yeah, my mileage increased as all those factors improved. This is Simon, who lo and behold, is also running around the coast of the UK. So you, there's so little kind of mediocre middle ground in that doing that kind of thing. So you're always either having a great time or an absolutely terrible time. So it's been weird to come home and just have like middle times when I'm just watching the TV with my mum with a cup of tea, which is really strange. Um, but I think I definitely worry less about stupid little things because you get so used to all you have to think about is where you're going to sleep, where you're going to eat, where you're going to run. And then I think about ridiculous things, I'm like, oh, it doesn't really matter, does it? So yeah, that's good, but um, it's definitely highs and lows, peaks and troughs. So everybody talked about the post-adventure blues, but actually I haven't had, it's been seven weeks now and I haven't hit yet. I'm having a great time at home. I'm really enjoying it. My dad's making loads of apple crumbles. It was, it's great. But I think it helped because I didn't just go straight back to my desk job that I was doing before. Um, and I think that would have been a really hard adjustment. Do I just carry on? 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just really am appreciative of not having to run really far every day with the backpack on, so I'm really enjoying being back at home. My planning was atrocious. The day before I left, I'd never run with my backpack. My sleeping bag actually hadn't arrived because I hadn't ordered it in time. Didn't really know where I was running the next day. And obviously, because it was Britain, that there wasn't too much danger factor. So I think as long as you've just done enough planning to stay alive and get you to the start line, that's all you need to do really. And I think people get so bogged down with the planning. And I had this notebook um, that I thought I would plan my adventuring, because that's what you did. And I looked at it the other day and it had three lines of writing in. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just think don't worry, don't overthink it. And if you hate it, you can always just come home. I mean, my friends would have laughed at me forever if I'd quit. But other than that, nobody really cares if you do it except for you. So you can give it a go. And if it's rubbish, then you can always stop. You haven't really lost anything. So social media and its involvement was definitely a pretty unexpected part. I made a Facebook page, which at the time I found so embarrassing that I was inviting my friends to like me on Facebook. People started, I guess, gradually sharing it and hearing about it. And so, so many people I stayed with were from social media. Kind of people got in touch from Facebook and said, I live here, do you want to come and stay? So that was amazing. And also it just really felt like you had so much support and I'd have a bad day and I'd put a post up and you just have so many nice comments, like tens of them, people saying, oh, keep going, we're really enjoying following it and it gives you a real boost. I've discovered that the best way to get my legs and my head working together is to talk to them in the only language they both understand and that involves speaking snacks. Like I said, I really enjoyed sharing my adventure on social media and it was generally really, really positive, but you do get some strange people. Uh, there's one guy who kept emailing me because he wanted to buy my worn shoes um, because he had, he's a foot fetish distributor or something. And yeah, he wants to sell my shoes on. He offered me about £100 a pair. So I don't think my shoe sponsors would have been very happy if I'd partaken in that. So I didn't go into that one. To give the camera an idea of what's going on over here, like, I don't think I'm in focus, but it's starting to rain, so sorry that you don't get one. That's okay, I've got a little more screw on. People always say, oh, your posts were really positive, and my parents just really laugh because they got all the moany phone calls and the down days. I did master a new trick to add to my repertoire, which was how to run, cry and breathe all at once. Surprisingly tricky, but it's something I've mastered after today. I keep telling people that doing something is so much less scary than thinking about doing something. So don't let the thought put you off because it seems really scary because you can't do anything about the things you're worrying about when you're just worrying about them. Whereas when they happen and you fall off a cliff, you're like, it's cool, I've fallen off a cliff. So. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> That's okay, I'm sorry the weather didn't hold up. That's okay, you could have chatted for a bit longer. Whisper me those sweet nothings. <laughs> Hey there guys, what you just saw was a recent documentary we did with Elise. She's a runner, as you could probably tell from that video. Um, you were actually the one to come across Elise, weren't you Rupert? So last year I was just kind of browsing through Facebook and I saw a girl upload a video vlog about how she was running around the UK. Um, and I thought it was really interesting, 5,000 miles around the British coast. It sounded kind of similar to our America adventure. Um, so I kind of got in touch and she said, absolutely, I'd love for you to come out and make a documentary. Fantastic. However, it took over a year to finally get it, get it, uh, get it together. Um, simply because I think when you're out on the road and you're doing some crazy physical challenge, you don't have time to answer your emails every 10 minutes. So getting something like that organized can be quite difficult. And it was good, it was good. I thought Elise was really lovely. So thank you for your, your time on this. We're both actually quite passionate runners ourselves. In the build up to America, we trained a fair bit by doing running took part in a half marathon, didn't we? We did a fair bit of sprint training. We shot a documentary or like film early this year about running, about kind of, for me, it was about my personal experience of running and why running's important, how it affects me. And so, yeah, I think, I think it was kind of quite a cool topic to, to delve back into. Stay tuned for more running content. Probably not, but. Was that you running, like creating running content? Or was that you running because you were just here for the running content? Um, that was me creating running content. A running gag. I mean, the whole shoot was pretty much a success, really. We didn't encounter any problems. Uh, the only issue that did arise was at the end of the, um, end of the interview, there was a bit of rain that decided to uh, show its head, which uh, caused a couple problems, didn't it? I ran to the car to grab a couple waterproofs and a couple plastic bags. As we were filming the interview. Yes, yeah, so as the interview was going on, you can see me darting behind set, putting plastic bags and all the equipment to try and keep it as dry as possible. 
No, I think it's quite a straightforward format. You know, you take someone who has already got a kind of story or, or something like that, and then you kind of sit down with them, you film them, you film them from a couple of different angles, you make sure the audio is good, you get them chatting, you ask them about their story, and then you kind of go into post-production, you decide what are the most interesting parts of the story, what are the bits that are best told, what are the bits that are then, you know, most relevant to the B-roll, you know, we shot stuff with Elise running, uh, we shot stuff on the drone, which was a bit nerve-wracking at one point because we think the drone got wet and that interfered with the ampage in the drone, like power thing. It's wireless on your phone and it tells you if there's any issues, it also tells you things like altitude and stuff. But it, it, it popped up with this big warning sign saying, voltage issue, wasn't it? Something to do with voltage, specifically drone returning home. So we were a little nervous then. Uh, we then saw it come back though quite high up and it was returning in a very slow manner. Yeah, we also took this. Those of you who don't know what this is, this is the DJI Ronin. This is a motorized gimbal that you mount the camera to. We actually took these arms off. And then I skateboarded um, after, well longboarded after release, um, holding this like this. And then what the Ronin does is when my hand's wobbling around like this, you know, while I'm skateboarding, the Ronin offsets the, the movement of my hand. So if I move my hand all the way around like this and all of that, wherever I move my hand, the camera stayed still. It's also great as a piece of kit for two reasons. One, it's really fast to set up, it takes a few minutes. Uh, and two, the other good thing about it as a piece of kit is that you can get into really tight spaces. So if you're filming in London without like permits or on the street or whatever, you can't really be setting up like dolly tracks and running dollies or big tripods and running cranes. And this does pretty much the same thing. Um, it's relatively light and easy to travel. Apart from that, we took all three of our cameras. We took GoPro, the Sony, and the Lumix. We had them all set up in different positions for the entire interview. So I took all the video footage of Elisa's Facebook page and I made this kind of nice little montage to start with where if you watch all of her vlogs, essentially often she's talking about quite similar things, but normally she would have turned on the camera for a reason. They'll kind of be like a defining moment, like, you know, I just got chased by cows or, you know, having a really bad day or whatever. And so what I did is I made this mon montage that put together only the key moments from every vlog. So you can watch it really fast. It's like a minute long and you get a bit more of a sense of her entire trip, you know, in a minute, mm -hmm. as opposed to showing like 10 second or 30 second or 40 second extracts or whatever. So then the final thing we could kind of talk about is the skill of interviewing. And to me, interviewing isn't entirely about asking the right questions. You know, if you're going to go to your first interview and write a list of questions and you're like, I want to find out this and get this and get that. But actually, I think the best interviewers make people very comfortable. And that the interview starts from the second you meet that person. You know, so chat to them, find out a bit more about them, you know, find some common ground with them, try and really understand what headspace they're in. And once you kind of feel comfortable together, that's when you bring the camera into the situation because you don't want to bring a camera in and someone who's kind of new because it's quite difficult to be open about it. And you're definitely not going to get something out of someone that isn't either awkward or rehearsed. And then once we actually start press recording, we'll do an audio test first. We'll be like, right, okay, we're recording. So um, tell me what you had for breakfast. And people go, oh, what did I have for breakfast? And they'll kind of have to think and they'll tell you what they had. And then you get this kind of like nice moment where they kind of chat a little bit and you, you can test the audio because you then stop recording, play it back, check everything's good. And then also, you know, they're that little bit more comfortable. Yeah. But the dream scenario is, is you get someone talking and they almost run the interview. Well, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed that. Um, I, this kind of documentary it was kind of relatively straightforward, creative, you know, kind of creatively. So I hope you kind of got something from this vlog. If you didn't, sorry. Let us know. Let us know. Um, and we've got some very exciting changes to be happening soon. We've got a very exciting series to be coming out soon. And we've got some kind of very exciting announcements. So good stuff. We'll see you next week for a new video. Till.